Programs webinar uh, titled, What Does It Really Cost to Provide Your Services? Understanding and Communicating Administrative, Indirect, Shared, and Overhead Costs. My name is Sandy, and I'm the organizer for today's webinar. Um, this webinar will help your organization clarify what it is actually spending to deliver each of its services, including the fair share of organization management and overhead costs that are essential to being able to operate any services. Um, just a little reminder, if you haven't already registered for our annual conference, please do. It is um, titled Grounded for Growth. It is being held at the Heathman Lodge in Vancouver, May 3rd through the 5th. Uh, today's presenter is Kay Soule, and I'm going to go ahead and let her do a little introduction of herself once I go through some of the logistical information. So before we get started, um, throughout this presentation, your lines will be muted. Um, we will be using the chat feature at the bottom of the page, so if you have questions, um, you can go ahead and put them in there, and we will answer them as they come in. I will handle most of the logistical questions, and then... Kay will be um, answering more direct questions um, around content. Uh, the materials from the presentation will be recorded and archived and posted on our website in about a week. Um, you'll also have access to the slides, um, and we are going to also make a Moodle out of this for future training opportunities. Uh, this webinar will count as one and a half hours of ongoing sexual assault continuing education um, credits. So. Uh, be sure and, and document this in your employee files. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that the, at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email with an evaluation as well as um, any attachments that we have with that. So please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation. And at this time, I will hand this over to Kay Soul, and she will tell you a little bit about herself. Okay, well, thank you, Sandy, and thank you to everyone on the call and webinar for your patience as we get started. Um, actually, before I tell you about me, I want to find out who is with us today, and then I will tell you a little bit about my background and uh, probably some of the peculiarities that you'll notice as we go through this topic. So um, you, if you've been on webinars before, you know that the key with these polls is that you need to pick the box that describes who you are. Are, and as you start clicking in and telling me who's on the call, it will appear on the screen, I think, and we will know uh, kind of the mix of our group today. So, Sandy, are people polling in? Looks like we've got a few responses, but not as many people as on the call. It's coming along. Okay. So maybe while that is flashing in front of us, I will tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've been working actually with domestic violence and sexual assault programs for well over 30 years. Um, I live in Oregon, but my training practice and consulting practice now is national. And actually, I've probably spent more time with sexual assault programs in Washington than any other state. So I've probably met a number of you in person. Uh, I do have a, a somewhat unusual background for this topic in that for many years I was the executive director of a nonprofit organization that had to deal with our topic today every single day in terms of understanding how much it costs us to deliver each of our many different services. But I also have a background as an accountant. I'm a licensed public accountant. I've been an auditor. And uh, so I also look at this from a somewhat technical point of view. And more recently, I have been focusing a lot of my practice on working on the challenges of nonprofit compliance with the new federal funds management rules, the uniform guidance. And we're going to do a follow-up webinar um, later on in this series that is going to go into more depth about what those new federal rules are going to mean to nonprofits as they try to recover their um, indirect and overhead costs from governmental agreements. But for today, we are really going to be focused on um, the issues of understanding costs 
as internal managers and really getting clear about what it costs to deliver each one of our services. Um, and so we didn't get a lot of participation in that poll. I'm going to take it back, and uh, we had mostly executive directors and eight who uh, characterized themselves as others. And so if, as I keep moving, you wanted to chat in uh, some of what that other means to you, I'd be really interested in that. Um, I know that in Washington, we have a number of our sexual assault programs being carried out by nonprofit organizations that actually offer multiple different services. And one of the challenges in undertaking this topic today is that we're going to have organizations where we have the actual action executive director with us and the entire system can be focused on getting clear about the cost of specific programs. I think we probably also have some people with us who are working in much, much larger organizations that have multiple different functions, and we may have the sexual assault program director with us, but that person is not going to be as able to influence the structure of the budgeting and accounting in that larger agency. So I'm going to try to be clear about the, the issues in this topic, but I'm also going to do that with the understanding um, that some of our participants are in very different situations in terms of how you may be able to use the information. So, you know, why, why are we interested in overhead right now? Well, it's really because most of us in the sexual assault field do depend on governmental funding for a substantial portion of what is going to support our efforts. And one of the challenges that we've had for a number of years is in being sure that when we negotiate an agreement with one of our governmental funders, they are actually agreeing to pay us the full cost of what it takes to deliver the service. And we're going to talk about what happens if we have a funder that does not agree to pay the full cost. But the reason why we're talking about this topic right now, why now, is that the changes have, that have just been made in the federal rules, which are going to impact not just funds that we receive directly from the federal government, but also funds that we receive through agreements with the state of Washington, where the source of the funds is the federal government, and also for many of us, a agreements that we have with counties or local governments where, again, the original source of the money is federal, and in some cases we have agreements with other nonprofits where the source is federal. And what is happening right now is that the changes that came about through the federal uniform guidance are rippling down through all those layers to reach us, the providers of services, and they really are going to open up a new opportunity for us to be sure that we are able to charge on our governmental agreements the full cost of delivering the service. It's going to be complicated in many, in many cases, and so this is our first um, session looking at the basic framework for that idea of trying to recover the full cost of delivering a service, and then we'll take it even further in the second webinar. Now, how the federal government came to get interested in issuing this uniform guidance is a long and complicated story. There are many, many factors that led to that decision. But one of them was a national conversation that has been going on about what is called the starvation cycle in nonprofits. And kind of the bottom line of that conversation is a recognition that all across the country, the government is relying on nonprofit organizations to deliver critical services. And particularly in Oregon and Washington, this has been true for many years that we just would not get critical services delivered if it weren't for the existence of community-based nonprofits. 
but what people at Stanford and Harvard and the other sort of academic thought leaders have been saying for a number of years is some of the approaches that both government and then charity raiders and foundations have taken in the way that they look at the cost that they will pay and they won't pay in nonprofit organizations is actually undermining the sustainability of the nonprofit organizations. And we refer to this as the starvation cycle, meaning that because our governmental and foundation funders are unwilling to pay the full cost of delivering a service, the result is that while we try to make up the gap in a number of ways, we're losing ground, and many of us are not able to build up the reserves that we need to be strong organizations, and many of us are not able to invest in the infrastructure and in the staffing that would really make us sustainable. And I know that some of you have participated in the recent series of conversations um, about the new VOCA funding. And a theme in those conversations was a piece of this starvation cycle and its threat to sustainability. So I think this is a pretty current issue in Washington. And the way it was expressed in that series of conversations was that because of the way that we are being reimbursed, we have not been able to pay adequate compensation to our staff that are delivering the services and managing our programs. And the result of that is turnover and not only the loss of expertise, but also a, a further deterioration of our sustainability. So I think this topic is directly relevant, and particularly to me it's relevant because I know that uh, through the great lobbying that sexual assault programs and others did, uh, we actually have an increase in growth of funding and an openness to trying to address this question. And I feel like in many ways the ball is now in our court in the nonprofit sector to really step up and understand what it costs to deliver our services and to be able to communicate it clearly. Because I think we finally reached a point where our funders are more open than they have been to allowing us to cover the full cost of delivering our services. Now, you may wonder about this next slide, and you may already be wishing you had a cup of coffee in front of you, uh, but there, the, there is a theme here, and that is to think for a moment about how you actually decide, if you're going to buy a cup of coffee somewhere, where to go. What's the basis for your decision if you're trying to decide, to decide between going into a Starbucks and maybe going into a local coffee shop to buy a latte? How do you actually decide? And if you're sitting with a friend, you can compare notes, but what people usually tell me is, well, taste. I like one, the taste of one better than the other. Location, is it convenient for me to go there? Um, my views about corporate America, would I rather patronize a local business than a big national and international corporation? Some of us would say price. I'm very price sensitive, sensitive and so I'm going to choose based on price. And you may have a, a further list, but one thing that I'm willing to bet that did not occur to you as a criteria for choosing where to go to get a cup of coffee. I will bet that very few of you said, well, I would compare the overhead and administrative cost of Starbucks and the local cafe. In fact, that isn't how consumers make decisions. Consumers make decisions based on the quality of product, the convenience, and the price. And yet, when we are put in a position to negotiate with governmental funders and with foundations and sometimes with our private donors, we find that their first question is often about our administrative costs or our overhead costs, and sometimes it's not even a question. It's a 
statement that we should observe a particular limit, that an overhead cost rate that is greater than 15% or 10% or 5% will not be acceptable and will not be paid. So it's clear that in the relationship between nonprofit service providers and both private and governmental funders, there is an assumption going on that a nonprofit with a low overhead cost rate is a good nonprofit, one that's really mission focused, and one that has a higher rate would be a bad nonprofit, one that is not committed to its mission. And really, uh, what I hope your big takeaway from this workshop will be is that that is purely a myth. And it is not an indication of quality of service or commitment of program um, that, in fact, what has happened as a result of this myth is that we as a sector have begun to distort our actual costs to the point where we are have a very difficult time in many organizations answering the question, what does it really cost us to provide a service? Now, for back in the coffee business, we know that if we are going to run a local coffee shop or we're running Starbucks, we have to know what it actually costs us to produce and market, sell that cup of coffee. It, if we don't know what our costs are, we are going to be having a very difficult time setting prices Right? How, how do we know what to charge for something if we don't know what it costs us to deliver it? And because of that information gap, we would have a very hard time deciding what products to sell because we wouldn't know which ones we could sell at a profitable price and which ones we couldn't. We might have trouble picking locations, and we would surely have trouble evaluating how much to invest in various improvements in our business. And so while nonprofits have a very different motivation than Starbucks or even the local coffee shop down the, down the street, we have a need for the same information about what it really costs us to deliver a service. And the reason we need the information is we do get to set a price, not a price for the direct consumer because most of us in sexual assault are not charging for our services. And if we do have a component of us, our service where we have figured out how we can bill for certain components, we're usually talking about billing insurance. So we're not directly charging the customer at all. But we do set a price when we decide whether we can afford to accept a proposed governmental agreement, and we also set a price when we submit the budget proposal to a foundation, having described an important service that we want to develop or enhance, we've got to be sure that what we ask them to pay for that is what it truly costs, because if the price that we're going to charge to the payor whether it's a government, whether it's an insurance company, whether it's a foundation, if the price we're going to charge is lower than it, what it actually costs us to deliver it, we're going to have to find a subsidy to close that gap. If we can't find someone else to come in and pay part of the cost, we're going to go broke, and we are eventually going to erode our ability to keep operating the organization. Um, so when you step back and think about an individual nonprofit organization that is unable to get the funders of each of its programs to pay the full cost of delivering the service, you can say, well, where are we going to go to close that gap between what the primary funder is willing to pay and what it actually costs? 
And the answer to that question is, well, sometimes some of us have been quite successful in developing a pool of individual donors. And we learn to craft our appeal to focus it on the total value of our work. And what's really going on in some cases is that those individual donors, through their unrestricted gifts, are covering a gap that is created by our inability to recover our legitimate overhead costs from governmental and foundation funders. Some of us do find third-party payers, but I actually think the primary source of subsidy in most of the community-based nonprofit world is by underpaying our staff. Um, and they are the true donors, the people who are really keeping the programs going. But I also think we should acknowledge that there is a cost to our customers, our clients, our participants, and to our communities. Because when we are unable to meet the full cost and we have to use low wages as the primary source of subsidy, there is a deterioration in the quality of our services, and there's a limitation in what we can provide. Okay, so that's all saying, you know, why are we even interested in this topic? Well, it's because there are critical pieces of information that we need about what it really costs us to deliver our services in order to make good decisions about which programs we're going to offer and which funding agreements we're going to accept. Both, we also need that information to make decisions about investment in infrastructure. And that is one of the huge challenges of the nonprofit sector, that we know that to be more effective in our ability to deliver services, we need good technology. We need good management systems. We need good training. We need good infrastructure. So we, we need to be able to recover our costs to do that. And finally, the whole reason for trying to get more nonprofits to really engage in thinking about the full cost of delivering services is that as a sector, we need to be able to communicate more clearly about what it really costs to deliver our services. Now, here's one of the challenges of our sector. And it is that you know, there are millions of nonprofits across the country, there are many, many foundations, there are tons of governmental entities, and there are lots of individual donors. And what we have come to realize is one reason we don't communicate well about the issue of overhead costs or indirect costs or administrative costs is that Within our sector, we call the same costs by different names, and we call different costs by the same name. And I'm going to illustrate that as we go through. But because of this language confusion, it is extremely difficult to have meaningful comparisons among organizations or to make meaningful statements about what is a reasonable administrative cost or a reasonable indirect or overhead cost. Now, one of the interesting things that's been done in the last few years as more people have gotten interested in this subject is that there's actually been some surveying done comparing what grant makers, and in this case we're talking about private foundations, not governmental grant makers. I think we could get this confusion even greater if we had a third column here. But so we have the views of grant makers and the views of nonprofit organizations asking for the, the term that would have the closest meaning to the term indirect cost. Now, those of us who have done a lot of work with direct federal funding are pretty used to hearing the term indirect cost. Now, for some of us that have mostly gotten our federal money 
through pass-through grants, through the state or through local government, we may not have been hearing the term indirect cost much before. We might have been hearing the term administrative cost. But now that the feds have changed the rules, now that there is the uniform guidance, that term indirect cost is going to be used more and more frequently in talking about the cost structure of nonprofit organizations. So in this survey, we went out and we asked foundations and we asked nonprofit organizations, which of these terms do you think really corresponds to the meaning of the words indirect cost? And you can see that there really was complete disagreement all the way around. Um, and there are disagreements between what grant makers think terms mean and what nonprofits think terms mean, but there's also disagreements within grant makers and among nonprofit organizations. So we do not have a clear definition. Obviously, we don't have a clear definition of the term indirect cost. I would say we also don't have a clear definition of the term overhead. We have a fairly clear definition of the term administrative cost, but we just struggle as a sector to know how that term meshes with terms like overhead and indirect. So that's what we're going to really focus on today is to at least have a common vocabulary for while we talk to each other. And actually it's not possible to figure out what it really costs to deliver a service until you can come to some common vocabulary about these terms. Now, those of you who have been around for a while know that within the nonprofit sector, there are several frameworks for talking about our costs. And if you've ever been responsible for filling out the Form 990, the annual report that nonprofits make to the IRS, you know that that form requires nonprofits to take each type of cost, like salaries, supplies, telephone, and divide it up according to the purpose. Why did you pay that salary? And that's the purpose question or functional question. Did you pay it for a programmatic purpose? Did you pay it to get management done? Or did you, get it, did you pay it to get fundraising done? So that's a very common framework for the sector. We know that in the world of governmental funding, particularly the world of federal direct funding, we would hear about a distinction being made between direct costs and indirect costs. That is the framework that they would use. And then we're going to go further and say that for some of us, we can't get to the question of what does it really cost to deliver a service if we aren't able to use a framework that says, well, yes, there are program costs, there are shared costs, and there are administrative costs and fundraising costs. And those are going to be the four areas that we really hone in on. Uh, so this is just a picture of the 990. You've all seen that before. Um, and now we're going to talk about sort of how does the government look at this issue of direct and indirect cost. And I would say that these concepts are also concepts that are used in business accounting as well as governmental thinking. And that is that we're now not talking about function. A function is was it a programmatic function, was it a management function, or was it a fundraising function. Now we're talking about behavior of cost. And cost can either be directly associated with a function. For example, if I were to run a senior lunch program and I buy lunches for the seniors, I can make a direct association between those lunches and delivering the senior services. And if I am running a sexual assault program where part of what we do is ongoing support groups for victims of sexual assault, and I hire a support group facilitator, I can make a direct connection between that facilitator and the program of having sexual assault support groups. 
So those are direct costs, and no one has any trouble with them. The problems we have are with costs that cannot be directly associated with any particular function, whether it's a program function or a management function or a fundraising function, because these costs benefit multiple functions. And a good example is our audits. Okay, we have an annual audit done. We have to have it done in order to know where things stand financially. So in that sense, it benefits all of our costs. It benefits the programs, it benefits the management, it benefits fundraising. It's not possible to say what part of that audit cost directly benefits each program. Similarly, if we have all of our activity, our programs, our management, our fundraising, if it's all being conducted in one giant facility that we are renting, paying rent on it, we are not going to negotiate separate leases for each program for the management and for the fundraising. That's going to be an indirect cost, and we're going to have to figure out a fair way to estimate the benefit that paying rent provides to each of our programs and to our management and to our fundraising. And the core message here is that whether you're talking about program functions or fundraising functions or administrative or management functions, to understand what it really costs to perform those functions, you're going to have to look at both the direct costs and these indirect costs, the indirect costs, the costs that provide multiple benefits to multiple functions, and that the benefit has to be estimated. So let's just think about what are we talking about when we say management or administration. Well, what's on the screen right now is the classic definition. Um, this is the definition that occurs for accountants in GAAP accounting. It's the definition that pretty much corresponds to the IRS definition, pretty well corresponds to the federal government's definition. And what all of us would say in this definition is the cost that an organization incurs to keep its board running, board support costs, that's an administrative function. The cost of performing financial management for the entire agency, maintaining the general ledger, producing financial statements, having an audit done, that's an administrative cost. High-level human resource management and IT management that are for the organization as a whole. So when we say IT management, we don't mean somebody who touches a computer. We mean if we have a, an IT director who is doing our total planning for all technology, that's going to be an administrative function. If we have a high-level HR director who is dealing with compliance issues on our employment practices, is negotiating our fringe benefits, that's going to be an agency-wide administrative function. So those are the most common definitions of administrative functions. And the thing that is often very confusing about administrative costs is that some of our administrative costs, we can see a direct association between a type of cost and say, well, that's administration. I paid for the audit that was directly an administrative cost. Uh, but it is also true that administrative costs taken as a whole, if we added up all those different administrative costs I was just talking about, that whole administrative function provides an indirect benefit to the whole organization. And you're going to see that the, the consequence is that if we want to know what it really costs to deliver any service that we might be interested in delivering, we are going to have to know about the cost that is directly associated with that service and the costs that are indirectly associated, for example, a portion of the administrative cost. Now, when we talk about fundraising, you know, we're talking about making unsolicited requests to get contributions. So we know what fundraising is. 
But when we talk about fundraising costs, we have both direct costs, like we're hiring a director of development to do fundraising for us, and we also have shared costs. We're going to let that director of development work inside in that facility that we've rented. And we're going to do accounting for our contributions, and that is an administrative cost that has to be shared out and considered part of fundraising. And finally, when we're talking about program costs, so I may have a children's program, I may have a sexual assault survivors program, I may have a prevention program, I have many different programs that I am running. And when we try to get down to how much does it cost us to do each of those programs, it's going to be pretty clear that some costs I can directly associate with one of those programs. I hired a prevention coordinator. All she does is work on prevention. She's a direct cost of the prevention program. Where we get into more challenging questions is when we're talking about the shared costs that benefit multiple programs as well as management and fundraising and have to be divided up through an estimating method to get to the full cost of delivering our services. Now, this is where we start running into the tremendous language problems. And it's this term overhead that, as we saw on the survey, has so many different meanings to so many different people. Now, some people would say that the overhead in our organization is just the administration. That's the only overhead cost we have. Others would say, well, that's not true. It's administration plus the facilities and any other shared costs. Anything that I can't make that direct association between the cost and either a specific program or the administrative function or the fundraising function, anything that can't be directly attributed to the delivery of a specific service or function, I'm going to call that an overhead cost. Well, no wonder if we have such different definitions of what is an overhead cost we end up saying that different organizations have very different overhead rates. So what we're going to try to do here is bring this down to some examples and see how it would play out in each of your organizations. Now, a core concept that we're going to be working on is the idea that if you want to know what it costs your organization to deliver any one of your programs. And let's, let's just pick on a sexual assault prevention program as an example. If you want to know what it really costs to deliver that program, you would first start with the direct costs of the staff that work in that program. Maybe you buy publications. Maybe you have some training that only those staff attend. So you would start with the direct costs, but our question here is in your current system, do you also assign a share of your administrative costs, the financial management, the board support, all of those administrative costs, and a share of your shared or common costs, for example, your facilities or your copier or your phone system. So I'm, I'm looking for you to respond to a poll by saying, yes, I believe our current system does not just count the direct costs, but actually has a method for assigning a fair share of administrative costs and a fair share of other common costs to each of our services or programs. And I'm seeing a few people say, yes, I'm sure we're doing it, and others saying sometimes but not always, and others not being not sure, and, and that's an understandable answer. Um, and those who are saying sometimes but not always, I am willing to guess that the reason you are saying that is that you have some funding agreements that have imposed limitations or prohibitions 
on charging either administrative costs or other shared costs and that you are following those limitations or restrictions by not assigning a share of those costs to the programs that are funded with those funding agreements that prohibit them. And that is one of our central problems that we're going to try to work through today. So here's the premise that we're working from. You need the truth. Now, funders who are going to continue to refuse to accept the truth, or maybe they're going to accept it and say oh, it's the truth, but we're not paying it anyway, and that's fine. That's what they're going to do. We don't control that. But what we can control is our knowledge, what we understand about our costs. Because once we understand and communicate our costs, we can make some decisions about what we want to do in our organization. So the way I'm going to be defining full cost today is to say it's the direct cost that you can directly associate with the service. It's a fair share of a fair allocation of shared costs like telephone, like facilities, like your overall IT system, and it's a fair share of your agency administrative costs. So if I want to know what it costs to deliver a particular program, I'm going to add together the direct costs of that program, a fair allocation of shared costs, and a fair allocation of administrative costs. And so this is the same thing presented graphically, two programs, A and B, each one of them are going to get a share of the agency management and a share of common costs like facilities, copier, um, IT systems. Now, we're going to look together at a series of charts that illustrate some concepts in this idea of getting to the full cost. And part of what we're illustrating in these next few slides is that there are many different ways to get to the same end. And one of the challenges is to pick out the way that is going to work best in a particular organization. So we're going to start by looking at Organization A and the way they have structured their cost presentation. I'm now going to try to invoke my arrow. I got it up here. You'll see that they've got three programs, A, B, and C. They have an agency-wide administrative cost column, and they have another column for the shared costs that are not administrative. Now, one thing you might notice is in this shared cost column, they've got a salary expense in there. And you might think, well, wait, you said it wasn't administration, so this can't be the financial manager. What staff could we be paying that would be a shared cost? And I would say, well, how about if you're paying a janitor who is going to clean the entire facility? How about if you're paying a receptionist who is going to answer phones and greet people and benefit every one of your programs plus your management plus your fundraising? That's what we've put in shared costs. And in this example, we've totaled up all those shared costs and we've divided them or allocated them among the three programs. And we've also assigned them to the administrative function because the people performing those management functions also benefit from the shared costs. We, we wouldn't do very well at having effective management if we made the people work outside. So they benefit from common costs, too. And what we've come down to down here is the combination of the direct expenses and the shared expenses. And, you know, if you wanted to talk about these shared costs in this example on a percentage basis, it would turn out to be 7.1% in the shared cost. Now, I'm going to look at a different example. This is Organization B, and you'll notice right away that their shared cost total up to 39%. They've got the same format, three programs, A, B, and C, an administrative cost column, a shared cost column, but they have a lot more costs in the shared cost column. 
Now, something else to notice here is that they also happen to have total costs of $500,000. And back in Organization A, the total costs were $500,000, too. So it's not that this is a better funded or more extravagant organization. It's that they consider more of their costs to be shared costs. Now, it is a different organization. This is Organization B. That was Organization A. So it's possible that they actually have different facts and circumstances. It's also possible that they have simply chosen to look at things differently and to consider that more of their costs are really benefiting all three programs plus management. The important thing to notice is that by the time they have allocated those shared costs, there is not much difference between the cost of delivering programs A, B, and C than there was when we had a lower shared cost rate. Okay, we're going to go on now to another example. This is organization C that would say it has no shared cost, zero shared cost. Now, how is that possible? Well, one possibility is the people are really nuts and they have leased three different facilities, one for each of their programs, and then they leased a fourth facility for their management. Um, they decided to have separate phone systems, completely separate computer systems, so that they actually have no shared costs. It's really unlikely. That would be so inefficient that it is improbable. What is more likely is that they have chosen to allocate those shared costs on a line item by line item basis. So remember we had the receptionist over in organization A. They may have chosen to set up their system so that they automatically allocate 10% of that receptionist to one program, 30% to another, 10% to management, and they make the shared costs disappear, okay? And yet the total cost of operating this organization is $500,000, and there is relatively little difference in the cost of the specific programs, although there is some difference. Okay, so that's what's happened here. And now we're going to take a look at the worst of all possible worlds, which is what would happen if Organization A decided to combine two columns. They decided to combine their shared and administrative cost column. Now, the numbers don't really change. It's still $500,000, but what's happened here is the reader of this information is almost certainly going to consider this to be high administrative costs. And this comes back to the confusion that we all have about what are we talking about when we're talking about overhead, shared, and administrative costs. And we're dealing with a perception among the funding community that whatever we're talking about, it's something bad. It's something that should be minimized. So when we see something that looks higher, we tend to get negative feedback on it. So this is probably not a great way to present this information, but it may be a, 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 a actually a fairly efficient way to handle the information. Now I want to go further and then we're going to come back to um, what are the alternatives and how are you going to actually use this information to understand more about your cost. But before I do that, I want to understand something about who's with us on the call and how many of you have gotten a federally negotiated indirect cost rate. And what I'm seeing here from the respondents is we, we have a majority who are responding, who have a rate. I suspect from having looked at the list of registrants that that's not quite true in, uh, in terms of our total participation. In order to get a federally negotiated indirect cost rate, your organization must have at least one funding agreement directly with a federal agency. So if all of your federal money is coming to you 
through pass through entities like the state or the county or another nonprofit, you can't get a negotiated rate. Those that do have direct funding can negotiate a rate. And part of what confuses the discussion in the nonprofit sector is that we can choose among many different methods for negotiating that rate. And so even though we may have, in our example here, we have five organizations that have negotiated indirect cost rates, the difference among their rates may be significant. We may have some who says, say our rate is 14% and another one may say their rate is 40%. But what we can conclude from the slides we just looked at and the slide that as we go further we're going to look at is that that information, that piece of information, that one organization has negotiated a rate of 14% and another has negotiated a rate of 40 tells us nothing about the efficiency of their operation, about their commitment to their mission, about anything other than the mechanics of how they have chosen to look at their costs. The one thing that it does tell me is that in doing their negotiation, they probably have come to terms with what it really costs them to deliver their services. And here's what I mean by that. Where we're trying to go today, the, sort of the, the goal of this conversation, is to get to a point where our organizations are able to actually um, determine the fully loaded cost of delivering their services. So I'm going to try to get my arrow to activate. Pause it here while I try again to get it to move for me. There, I got it. Sorry for the delay. I'm still hoping I can move it. Okay, if you look down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see there it is, the fully loaded cost line. And um, what we have done to get to this number is we started out with the same format we've been looking at. We took our shared costs, we allocated them across our programs, and we gave the administrative cost center a share. And that got us to our total administrative cost for the organization. And now we have allocated that cost among our three programs. And we are now finally to the point of being able to say, what is the full cost of delivering program A? And we know that that cost is comprised of the direct expenses of program A, a share of the common costs like the receptionist, like the rent, like the telephone system, and a share of the agency-wide administrative costs. And together, that is going to give us the full cost of delivering program A. Now, the, you know, you probably have a lot of questions in seeing that. And one of the questions that I'm always asked when people look at this is, well, how did you decide how much of the shared costs to assign to program A and how much to program B? And how did you decide how much of the administrative costs to assign to program A or program B? And the answer to that question is, well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, we could do it on a way that would be proportionate to the total direct cost. In other words, if program A costs twice as much as program B, I could give them twice as, as big a share of the shared cost and administrative cost. I could use that proportionality just on personnel cost. I could say if, there, if the personnel costs of Program A are twice as high as the personal, personnel costs of Program B, I'm going to give them twice as large a share of administrative costs and common costs. Or I could say I don't think that those proportional methods really are that relevant to what is a fair estimate of the benefit received 
by a particular program. And so I'm going to use other specific measurements. And a really common one would be square footage. I've got this one big facility. I'm going to have a diagram of it. I'm going to measure how many square feet are tied up in delivering program A, program B, program C, and our management function. And I'm going to turn that into a formula and allocate based on that. Now, maybe I'm going to say with my top here, I've got a little automated counter, and people from Program A enter their code, and we get a count of how many copies they made. All of those would be completely legitimate methods for allocating shared costs. And the important thing would be that we came up with a master plan, we all agreed that it was logical and that it had a, a reasonable relationship to what is the actual benefit received by each program. And the other thing we would ask ourselves when we were trying to come up with this method is we would ask ourselves, is this reasonably efficient to use, or is it going to be incredibly burdensome to figure out this allocation? Because we want something that is reasonably efficient to use. But we know that one of the problems we have is that we have um, funders that no matter how reasonable our allocation of costs, that I just showed you in, in the last slide. No matter how well we can defend the allocation method that we used, the funder is still going to impose a cap, a maximum, on certain kinds of costs. And the most common maximums that I encounter are on administrative costs. Sometimes they are stated as a maximum on shared costs. Sometimes that maximum is expressed as a cap on indirect costs, by which the funder means the combination of management costs and shared costs. So these arbitrary limits that are given to us, there's really two ways that I see people responding to them. Unfortunately, one way is to say, oh, well, the funder of Program A won't allow us to charge more than X percent, so we just don't charge that program any more than X percent. But if we choose that method, we are going to distort our understanding of what it really costs to deliver Program A. And in fact, if we choose that method and then shift what should have been Program A's share of management or other common costs over to Program B or Program C, uh, we are distorting our understanding of what those programs cost, and we're also violating one of the rules of managing federal funds that you can't just shift costs from one program to the next. So now this is an example of what happens when organization A has to apply a 5% cap on admin costs. So the funder of program A has said, we will pay no more than 5% admin costs. So this chart starts out just like the other ones we've been looking at. It starts out with... Um, where can I get my arrow to activate? Uh, it starts out with the direct expenses divided between programs A, B, and C and administration. Then we allocated the shared cost. Then we allocated the administrative cost to get to the fully loaded cost. So this is exactly like the slide we just looked at, getting to the fully loaded cost. What's different here is that we have had to deal with the limitation, and it's down there where it says chargeable to program A. And what that limitation represents 
is the $145,000 in total direct and shared costs plus the 5% we are permitted to bill for the administrative costs because of this cap. So that's how I can bill the funder of Program A a total of $152,000. But the reality is, down here on the subsidy required, that there is another $9,600 in administrative costs that were in the fair share of administrative costs allocated to Program A. They were included in that $15,930 in administrative costs allocated to Program A. It's just that they have been rejected in terms of being paid for by the funder that put the 5% cap. So when I'm trying to understand the full cost of doing Program A, I want to be looking at the $162,000 fully loaded cost. I don't want to be thinking that the full cost is $152,000. That's just what the funder will pay. The implication, if I start thinking that the full cost of the program is what the funder will pay, is that I'm going to have to move those $9,676, the fair share, off into somewhere else, and I am going to end up distorting my understanding of our cost structure. And because of that distortion, I'm going to be in a position where I'm very, very tempted to keep trying to underinvest in my administrative costs. So it's it's a, a, a reality that we have that there are some funders that impose these costs. But part of what has happened in many of our organizations is that over time, we have responded to those limitations by distorting our actual understanding of what it costs. And we cease to even ask for what it really costs us. Now, at our next webinar, when we start talking about the impact of the new federal rules, one impact is that we have another opportunity to start asking for what it really costs. But in order to take advantage of that opportunity, we're going to have to be able to know the full cost of funding. So let's pause for a moment and talk about um, what we can do about the problem of recovering full costs. And one of the things that many of us have been doing for a long time is we have been trying to make these costs be invisible. And if you remember the chart where we showed no shared costs, that's an example of doing that. We don't have any column that we ever show anyone that shows what our common costs are. Instead, we have allocated those costs out to all our programs. In fact, I'm going to flip back and have us look at that for a moment while we talk about this because um, this is uh, really a big part of our challenge here. So this is the slide where we saw the people uh, have no shared costs. And um, now I've got my arrow. Great. They had no shared cost. So what we said that meant is that they had made them disappear by allocating them out to each of the three programs. There are some organizations that do the same thing with their administrative costs. They actually divide them all up, and they present their cost picture as if there were no administration or no shared cost. That's less common because we all know that by the time we get to the 990, we are going to have to break out those administrative costs. And because we're audited, we know that GAAP requires that we break them out. Now, one of the problems that happens in systems where we have decided that we want to make these shared costs disappear is that when we get new programs, we just added a program D or a program E, or when we lose a program, we have a program defunded or we decide to drop it, 
we're going to have to reshuffle those allocations. And it is not going to be immediately clear that the reason that the cost of doing the remaining program has changed is because of the change in allocating these shared costs. So one of the advantages of being able to design a cost analysis system that calls out or identifies both the administrative cost and the shared cost for the agency is that when we undergo change in our program structure, we can still see what our shared costs are and we can immediately see the impact of a change in the allocation. It's more explicit rather than implicit. Well, now I'm going to take us back to where we stopped a moment ago, where we were talking about the strategies to improve cost recovery. And I've got it back on slide. So the other thing that many of us have done for many years to make our costs more palatable to funders is we have been very, very careful to use a very narrow definition of what is an agency-wide administrative cost. And um, this is something that is worth revisiting regularly because often what happens as time goes by in an organization, we have costs that people recognize are benefiting multiple programs, but not all costs that benefit multiple programs are actually administrative costs. But over time, there is a tendency to start throwing those common costs, or what I've called shared costs, into the administrative cost category. That's problematic because administrative costs, first of all, does have a real definition. We looked at that. But more than that, that tends to be the type of cost that would have the most reaction, most negativity on the part of funders. So one of the things that you learn over time is you have to continuously revisit what is being put into your administrative cost category to make sure that you have not inadvertently included something that would be better characterized as a common cost or a shared cost. Um, this is going to be really important when we start looking at the impact of the new federal rules. Um, as many of you know, one of the changes in the federal rules is permission to use what is called the 10% de minimis rate to recover what the feds are calling indirect costs. Now, for most of us that have a negotiated indirect cost rate, we, First of all, we can't use this new provision, and secondly, we wouldn't want to because generally we've negotiated a rate that is higher than 10%. But one of the things that we're seeing is for organizations that have not been able to negotiate an indirect cost rate with the federal government, they have often been put in a position with some of their funders of not being permitted to get any administrative or indirect costs or very, very low rates. So now the feds have come up with a minimum rate. And it unfortunately, it's pretty complicated how to use that rate, but the starting point for learning how to use that rate is to be able to do the cost analysis that we just illustrated in the charts that we've been taking a look at. Now, I want to say one more thing about the charts that we've been looking at. And that is, I'm going to go back and look at this fully loaded chart. You, you probably immediately noticed that something that is in your cost analysis that is not in these examples is a column for fundraising costs. And I actually deliberately eliminated that column from these examples because I know that among nonprofits, there are two very, very different ways of handling fundraising costs. And I didn't want to take a position one way or the other. So let me just say that in your real life cost analysis, you will have a cost center for each of your programs, a cost center for your administrative costs, 
probably a cost center for your fundraising cost and a cost center for your shared cost. And what do I mean by there's two different schools of thought or two different ways of looking at fundraising costs? Well, some of us that have spent a lot of time dealing with federal and other governmental funding have really been schooled in the thought that, you know, fundraising costs are always going to be unallowable costs, so I would never want to allocate them out to my program. Other organizations that live more in the world of private funding would say, well, no, fundraising costs are a type of overhead cost, just like the shared cost, just like the management cost that you've been talking about, and I do want to allocate them out. And when I talk about the full cost of doing Program A, I am going to add another line to the chart. You've got a line to allocate shared costs. You've got a line to allocate administrative costs. I'm going to add a line to allocate fundraising costs. Because we do live in such different worlds, I didn't include either the allocate them or the don't allocate them method. Uh, my own preference is the don't allocate them method, but that's, a, that's another story that we could talk about another time. But I wanted to make that clear. Now, let's kind of come to the, the heart of the matter. For many of us in sexual assault, we are one program operated by a nonprofit organization that has multiple programs. Some of us are within health organizations. Some of us are in community action agencies. Some of us are in large social service agencies. We are not standalone. Some of us are in a combined domestic violence and sexual assault structure. So when we think about what we've been talking about here, I want to know what it really costs for me to deliver each of my sexual assault services or each of my domestic violence services for that matter. We know that if we're program managers, we're pretty clear on what the direct cost of each program is. But in order to know what the fair share of common costs things like facilities costs, technology costs, telephone costs. In order to know that, we're dependent on the central um, financial management function of our organization. We're dependent on them identifying those shared costs, developing a budget for those shared costs, and then deciding on a methodology to allocate those shared costs. And the same thing is true about agency administrative costs. If I'm running the sexual assault prevention program, I do know my direct costs for that program. I know what personnel I have hired. I know what supplies we need. I know those direct costs. But I am dependent on the central management of the agency to, first of all, calculate the total administrative costs and the total shared costs, and then to come up with a methodology for allocating them. But when I am in a position to negotiate with a funder for one of my particular programs, I have to have an understanding of what my organization has decided to do about shared costs and administrative costs so that I am sure that what I negotiate is consistent with the true cost picture of my organization. So one of my hopes for people who participate in this webinar and the next one, I, I have executives, I know we have executive directors here. You are in a position as the executive director of an organization to evaluate whether your organization has slipped into the common practice of mistaking what a funder will pay for a program for what it really costs to deliver the program. And if you are the executive director, you're in a position to get your fiscal staff to reevaluate and actually get a more accurate picture of the full cost to deliver each service. 
But if you are a program manager in a larger organization, you're going to have to open a conversation at your top management team about the methodology that is being used currently to identify the shared costs, to identify the administrative costs, and to allocate those costs. And I think it's worth opening that conversation sooner rather than later because that conversation is what's going to lay the groundwork for understanding whether the changes that have happened in how the feds are going to allow you to recover indirect costs and really get the full cost of delivering your services covered. Uh, it's, it's a conversation, it's a process, but it starts with your organization being really clear about what it costs to deliver each service and stepping back from distortions that have arisen because of limitations in past funding agreements. And just on this note, uh, as we wrap up, I want to be really clear that these changes that the feds have made are not just going to impact direct federal agreements. They are going to impact any agreement that has federal dollars in it. So your agreements with the state and with local government are going to open up the possibility of recovering full cost, but it's only going to help your organization if you have a really clear picture of what your full costs are. So, you know, this overhead issue that we've been talking about, it is a management issue, and it really is going to take management's decision that we're going to step away from a structure for looking at our costs that equates what a funder will pay for a program with what it actually costs to deliver that program. So, yes, we can do something if we're in management, but it is also very much a nonprofit sector issue. And one of the things that we are hoping as a sector we can change is this myth that it is somehow a legitimate way to evaluate nonprofit organizations based on their overhead costs or their administrative costs percentages. And if you've looked at Charity Navigator and some of the other charity rating services, you know that we're beginning to see changes in them. They're beginning to back away, but they've done a lot of damage already in persuading donors that this is how to think about nonprofit organizations. It is very much a government contracting issue, and um, part of what is happening right now with these changes is there, there is a new playing field. There's new rules that allows nonprofits to get a little fairer shake if we can advocate for ourselves. Um, but part of the problem that many of us have is the messaging challenge. If we have board members that have bought in to the myth that it's bad to spend money on management or it's bad to admit that you spend money on management, we're going to have to start at home first with educating our board members and then educating our donors and being sure that we have not been captured by this myth. Well, um, there are a lot of things that I hope this will help you do, and I want to take questions here and see what we can do, and I see some questions have come in uh, to the chat box, and I hope we can get some more. I hope that one of the things that you will do as a result of this webinar is um, actually have a conversation in your organization about how you define agency-wide administration or management costs. What do you put into that category? Do you use the term overhead, and what do you use it to mean? Do you use the term indirect? What does that term mean within your organization? 
And I, I just can't urge you enough, if you are a program manager or an executive director, do not assume that everyone else in your organization is using these terms the same way. Because really, within our sector, the same word is used to mean different things. So hopefully you'll have a big language clarification discussion. And then I hope you will also do a worksheet Take your annual budget that has your programs broken out, your admin broken out, your shared costs broken out, and whatever you decide to do with your fundraising costs, and do the kind of calculation we've talked about here, making notes to yourself about how you decided to allocate the common cost and how you decided to allocate the administrative cost. And once you've done that, and you can honestly say, I know the full cost of delivering each of my services, then you can start thinking about who's going to pay for that full cost. And is there any way I can get the primary funder, especially if the primary funder is government, to pay their fair share? Because remember that what we're really talking about here, when a funder has said, we'll put the 5% cap on admin, what they're really saying is I think somebody else should carry my burden. I think I should be able to shift my share onto somebody else. And you know, I think in many cases, funders aren't even aware that that's what they are asking. And one of the questions I often ask when I'm talking to foundation funders about this is, okay, you're telling me that I should take $10,000 that is the fair share that you should be paying if you say you want us to do this program. You think this is important. You think I should just shift that off onto somebody else. All right, but how would you feel if I told you someone else doesn't want to pay their fair share and I'm going to shift that off onto you, even though you're not in support of that other program? And at that point, most people kind of say, well, no, that wouldn't be fair. And at that point, we can really talk about, so why would it be fair that someone else pays your fair share? So it's a long conversation. I, it's just the beginning. I hope you'll have a chance to do some worksheets and to have some dialogue within your agency before the next webinar, which is in June, because in that webinar, we're really going to drill down into how the feds are talking about these administrative and indirect costs and the new opportunity that nonprofits have to actually fully recover those costs. But it will make a lot more sense if you have already um, gone through this analysis. Okay, and I'm now seeing uh, a question from Lori. Before, before I do that question, I'm just going to say, you know what else is in your slide deck? And I think you are going to get the slide deck from, um, from WhatsApp, at, and you may have downloaded it already. Is I, I'm going to talk to you about a very useful website on this topic, which is uh, from the California Association of Nonprofits. They have a major overhead project going on. They're doing tremendous education with state government and county governments and private foundations. It's a very interesting project, and they've got a lot of resources up on this website, including a toolkit for dealing with these issues. There are more resources you can go to, and if you haven't been looking at COFAR, that's the first link up there, I just really encourage you to look at that. That is the body that has been charged by the federal government with interpreting the uniform guidance, and they have actually done an outstanding job of putting information up on their website. Uh, I've also given you the link to CAPLAW which is a national legal technical assistance firm. It focuses on, focuses on community action agencies, but it really has information of benefit to anyone who is receiving federal funds. Um, so before we wrap it up, let's come back and take a look at these questions. And um, I saw one from Lori who said, how do you feel about a position in a program that does secretarial, administrative, fiscal duties 
but directly for the programmer, does not, and does not work directly with clients. So what are we supposed to do with that person's salary? Well, you know, this is one of the changes in the uniform guidance. In the past, we were told that if they were doing financial work, okay, if they were like doing spreadsheet, fiscal type duties, that automatically you do fiscal duties, you're in the agency-wide administration. Now there has been a clarification that says it's still administrative. If you're doing fiscal work, it is administrative in terms of the character of the cost but it is not necessarily part of the agency-wide administrative cost. You could have an administrative cost that could be directly charged to a specific program. And the example that's most often given is actually in Head Start where there's so much fiscal tracking that goes on. Sometimes community action agencies hire a fiscal person who works only in the Head Start program, that's their sole responsibility. They are not part of the agency-wide administration, so they aren't going to be allocated across the other programs. They are allocated to that program, but it is still administrative in character. So if there is a limitation on administrative costs, they're still going to be part of that, but they're not going to be part of a limitation on indirect costs or part of the cost allocation for the whole agency. Um, okay, oh, I see what yeah, saw, saw a note there. Okay, so now I see from another uh, questioner, so in a very small agency, can you spread the executive director's salary across the programs built into personnel costs? That is a great question. In a small agency, the typical thing I see an executive director doing is spending a, a significant portion of their time delivering program services. They may be supervising the staff that deliver the sexual assault services. They may be supervising on a programmatic level. I'm not talking about administrative supervision like, yes, you do have to fill out your time card and now, it, you know, and let me explain the benefits program to you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about let's sit down and talk about what's happening in the work you're doing with the clients. Let me explain to you how we do certain things in terms of delivery of the services. So if that's what the executive director is doing, and, and I've visited sexual assault programs that are small enough that the director is actually counseling with victims of sexual assault and going out on hospital calls and, and other direct service functions. If that's what your executive director is doing in a small organization, you're going to want to have them keep time records so that they can document that. And then I would say it is only the portion of their time that is spent fulfilling agency-wide administrative functions that needs to be put into the administrative cost center. So the board support time that they spend, the agency-wide strategic planning time, the time they spend supervising the accountant and working on the annual budget and reviewing the financial statements, that is administrative time. But the time that they spend either supervising the direct service staff or actually delivering direct services, that is a program cost and we can justify charging that directly into the program cost. Now, did I see any more questions? I'm looking back up. I think those were our, okay. Um, let's see. Okay, I've got an administrative assistant that I was just responding to a poll. Um, and I've got a comment that I didn't see when it came in, so I'm not sure. Uh, Right, what that one meant. And uh, Sandy, are you seeing any other ones that I can answer? I think we might have gotten all the ones I can. Um, so there was a follow-up question that says, um, I only work for our programs, not for the agency-wide programs as an um, admin assistant. So are you saying with the changes, we could directly charge my salary? Yes, 
and the, um, you probably heard the little hesitancy in my voice. <laughs> and in terms of compliance with the federal rules, yes, you could be charged to those programs. But remember that one of the requirements is that the agency follow its own policies. So if you're in a big organization and they have a policy that says, we're going to sweep anybody who performs any administrative function in any program, we're sweeping that all into our administrative cost center. If that's their policy, they need to follow it. So my approach would be to raise the question. My understanding is under the new federal rules, we could have a situation where we could direct charge my position, even though it is administrative in character, we could direct charge it to the programs that I work for, rather than put it into the agency-wide administrative cost pool. But in the end, it's going to be the executive director and the CFO that decide whether they want to change that as an agency policy or not. And, you know, honestly, there are some reasons why large organizations would prefer to pool those costs. When we're in a small organization, there's some reasons why we would prefer to get costs directly charged whenever we can. So I hope that helps. Well, I think that I'm seeing, Kay, um, it looks like we're right at the end of our time. So that okay. worked out perfectly. Um, if you would advance the to the next slide, that gives everyone the wrap up information oh, um, good. Okay. address, so that if more than one person happened to be attending the webinar from one agency, you can email me their information so that I can be sure to get the evaluations and and information and slides out to them as well. Um, but again, I want to you know just say thank you, Kay. This was a wonderful webinar. Great information. Wish I would have had this when I was a director. Um, so really good stuff to know. And well, Sandy, I, I just want to break in and say one thing that I just want to open up is if, you know, this information, you've kind of got to think about it. And if what happens is that you start thinking about it and you realize you do have questions, I'm very open to having people email me questions and I will get back to you with what I can tell you. So um, just let me know if you end up with follow-up questions. Oh, great. Thank you so much. That's, that's a valuable um, resource for everyone. So I will be getting the, um, the recorded webinar up on the website within about a week. You will be receiving um, a short evaluation at the end of this. So please, um, if you could just take a few minutes and fill that out, um, we'd really appreciate it. We use all of that information to plan for our next trainings and, and look at ways to um, really better serve all of our members. So. Um, again, that will be coming out at the end of this, and at this time, I will go ahead and stop the recording, and um, hopefully we'll see you all back in June. Thank you.